to the transgender community. I am more than willing to give you an audience, but I have some conditions. You must admit that Hannah Gatsby is not funny. That, that is a dog made entirely out of crayons. I don't need that. Ha ha ha. Wasn't that funny. Gee, if she didn't constantly reassure me that she's a good comedian, I might have forgotten to laugh there. That's how I'm going to meet your expectations, by adjusting them for you now. <laughs> so they are exactly what you're going to get. And then I'll meet them and you go, she's very good. And yes, I am, but I cheat. <laughs> Is that a laugh track in the background or does she have a sign telling the audience when to laugh like they do on game shows and sitcoms? Because I cannot fathom that people think this is actually funny, and trust me, it's not any better in context, though my expectations were met. Dave Chappelle made a very bold statement calling out Hannah Gatsby as not funny. Well, after watching both of her Netflix specials, Nanette and Douglas, which have a runtime of over two hours, I did not laugh out loud once. The best she got out of me was a slight smirk from this joke here. Now... Fair warning, my observations will be about Americans, which is broadly speaking you lot, right? So, and, and sorry, but making fun of Americans is still technically punching up, although that window is closing. Um... That was her best joke out of two hours. And don't give me the, you don't think she's funny because she has different political beliefs. That's not the case. Laughter is involuntary. If someone says something really funny, you will laugh whether you want to or not. That's why there are like a million You Laugh, You Lose challenges on YouTube. I've also featured comedians on my channel like Veer Das, who I very much disagree with on certain issues, yet when he told jokes about those very things, I still laughed. There's a reason why woke comedians aren't funny, and there's a reason why woke television shows and woke movies aren't good. It's because the people who create this stuff don't care about the audience. Allow me to elaborate more, but first, if you like the content you see on this channel, then consider making a donation. Viewer support helps keep me independent and it helps fund the channel. Links to my PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar pages can all be found in the description. And also, don't forget to support me on Alt Tech. Links to my Odyssey channel and my Minds page can be found in the description as well. Alright, since people have already talked about Amy Schumer's gross genital comedy and her not being funny like a million times, I've decided to use Hannah Gatsby to make my point. For those of you who don't know, Hannah Gatsby is an art graduate from Australia who aired out a little drama between her, Netflix, and Dave Chappelle on Instagram. Now that you're all caught up, let's continue talking about why she's not funny and why these woke shows keep failing. Exhibit A. And it will also include a fair dose and uh, what I call a gentle and very good-natured needling of the patriarchy. So that is in there. So it's very important very important that you expect that because it is there and if that's not your thing leave i've given you plenty of warning rule number one of building a huge audience don't alienate a large portion of people by telling them to not watch your show the woke crowd seems to love doing this by saying if you don't like it don't watch or this show is not for you every time one of their awful shows fails Clearly, Hannah's Netflix specials were not made with the audience and potential audience in mind because they aren't good. That being said, I think her special Douglas best illustrates how little she is actually interested in what the audience's preferences are. Here's how that special starts. So that's what's going to happen before the show even begins, right? I'm going to give you a very detailed blow-by-blow -blow description of exactly how the show is going to unfold. Now, this setting of expectations does go on a bit. I've had to cut the actual show in order to fit it in. Yes, that's what everyone wants when they go to a comedy performance, a syllabus that spoils all of the jokes. This was a very college professor way of writing a comedy special, but okay. There are two major problems with this design. One, people hate spoilers. Remember back in 2019 when everyone and Marvel was like, seriously, we will kill you if you spoil Avengers Endgame. Remember how big of a deal it was when Mark Ruffalo spoiled Infinity War? Badly Wait till you see this next Legion one. Mark. Everybody dies. Do do do, 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 do. Not everybody. No. Is that? No. Alien. Whatever. Can we rewind that part? Yeah. Can we? Then am I in trouble? <laughs> Someone in the comments said that he actually spoiled Endgame during this interview as well. But the point is, people don't like spoilers. 
This was a particularly stupid move from Hannah, because getting people to laugh is all about surprise. Unless I've already heard the joke and approved of it in the past, if I can predict what you're going to say, it's not funny. Like this joke. And you also need to expect one Louis C.K. joke. Now, I only have one joke. That wasn't it, by the way. The show hasn't started. We're still in the prelude. The one joke, it's very good. I only need one. It's a good, it was a good joke. It was a day off. I, I'm so solid. One Louis C.K. joke, it's a mic drop moment. The interesting thing about the Louis C.K. joke is that it happens very late in the show. So late, you will have forgotten that I told you to expect a Louis C.K. joke. There's Hannah kissing her own ass again. There's no better sign of someone who's bad at something than a person who constantly insists that they are good. Unfortunately, the Louis C.K. joke is not YouTube friendly, so I can't show it. However, I can tell you that it was totally expected because she said it was in the show and then challenged me by saying I would forget about it. Guess what? I didn't forget. And when it does finally show up, this great Louis C.K. joke at the end, it's like three seconds, and if you looked away from the screen during the instant that she said the joke, it would completely fly over your head. The second problem with this intro is a problem that has plagued the entertainment industry for years, which is stories that include no intro hook. A hook is something that the audience will find interesting. There are many ways to hook an audience depending on the type of entertainment medium that you're using to convey your message, but Hannah spends the first 14 minutes of the special introducing herself and spoiling all of her jokes. This is not entertaining. That's it. That's the show. That's everything you can expect. Expectations have been set, so the show starts now. It should have started when you walked out on stage. This situation reminds me of the new Dune movie because this was actually my biggest issue with it. The first 20 minutes of that movie was a giant exposition dump where nothing entertaining occurs until Paul puts his hand into a box. Seriously, I've gotten so pissed at movies doing this that I will actually set a timer to see how long it takes for the movie to start. I believe the first Venom movie was the worst offender because it didn't start until almost half the movie was over. But it's especially annoying in this case with a story like Dune that has a 600-page manuscript that you can just cheat off of. There's a reason why Frank Herbert started the book with the scene where Paul puts his hand into a box. It's called an intro hook. You need to make the audience care about your story before you dump a bunch of information on them about how your world works. Telling the audience, no seriously, you need to memorize all this stuff before you have earned an interesting scene, is selfish writing. The great thing about putting your hand into a box is that people can understand that scene without tons of backstory. Not to say the movie didn't do a good job with that moment, it's actually a really good scene with a very good theatrical depiction of the Jedi mind control thing they call the voice, but the director should have started with it. Currently, I think it's the best film depiction of Dune so far, but when you don't start with interesting stuff, people will ignore the exposition dump you gave them at the start, so they will find the rest of the movie confusing. Speaking of confusion, that brings me to my next point about Hannah Gatsby's woke comedy specials. Multiple times during her specials, her jokes are so poorly thought out that she has to explain them to the audience. <laughs> you know, for a long time I knew more facts about unicorns than I did about lesbians. <laughs> Another reason I struggled with... Co there are no facts about unicorns. If you have to explain the joke, it's not funny. The problem with this joke is that it can be easily interpreted multiple ways that kill the humor. It's possible to have facts about fictional characters. For example, unicorns are fictional horses. Fact. Or, if you want to be super intellectual, you could have interpreted it as the old definition of unicorn, which is an animal with a single horn like a rhino. So then the joke would completely fall flat because rhinos are real. Here's another example of Hannah explaining her joke. But here's the thing. I've never met a joke that I haven't wanted to call back. I've never met a joke. G'day. I've never met a... Met a joke. That's a pun. Catch up. This joke was so intellectual that either I am just too stupid to get it or it was a really bad pun. Either way, if you have written a joke that is so intellectual that it alienates a large portion of your audience, then you need to rewrite it. But people like Hannah are not going to get that because they actively avoid or ignore criticism. For example, people criticized Hannah's first Netflix special in the net for being a lecture. And then with said jousting stick, I'm going to set about tearing my hate as a new asshole. Yep, <laughs> quick as you like. Brand spanking new. And the way that I'll do that is by doing exactly what my haters accused me of doing, which is lecturing you. So in the middle of the show, I'm giving you a big old lecture. 
This is a valid criticism of that special, because a vast portion of it contains zero jokes and it was written that way on purpose. The best part about this criticism is that it's not political. It's not, I don't agree with that joke you said because I have different politics. Instead, it's a critique of her writing technique, which means it's something that applies to every comedian. But instead of listening to that criticism, she leans into it and makes the terrible mistake of purposefully designing her second special like a lecture. You want a lecture? I'll give you a fucking lecture. This is a lecture. I can't imagine doing that. You say you have tons of people telling you that this is bad design for a comedy show, so you provide them more of a thing that they don't like. Which is strange because you said in the intro that you were there to change minds. Allow me to tell you a personal story. After my second year on YouTube, a lot of people were like, wow, your channel is like 20 times bigger than it was last year. The reason it grew so fast is because tons of people told me what I was doing wrong and I changed my behavior. What I didn't do was have a ton of people tell me they don't want their comedy special to be a lecture, followed by me introing my next special with a syllabus and ending with a PowerPoint presentation. Because when you care about people, you'll memorize their preferences and you'll also try to act out those preferences with the best possible interpretation. But instead of doing that, and this is why the woke crowd continues to remain as terrible writers, instead of doing that, they play the victim. I am not a victim. Well, that certainly should be easy to disprove. Oh look, I found this Instagram post with Hannah playing the victim card, and it only took me like 10 seconds. Hey Ted Sarandos, just a quick note to let you know that I would prefer if you didn't drag my name into your mess. Now I have to deal with even more hate and anger that Dave Chappelle's fans like to unleash on me every time Dave gets $20 million to process his emotionally stunted, partial worldview. You didn't pay me nearly enough to deal with the real-world consequences of the hate speech, dog whistling you refuse to acknowledge. But I thought these were just jokes. It was certainly just a joke when you made two specials bashing straight white men. Now, if in that bit you find yourself offended by anything I say in the joke section, please just remember they are just jokes. Even if you find yourself surrounded by people who are laughing at something you find objectionable. But really, the weirdest thing about this statement from Hannah on Instagram is that she spent the entirety of the comedy special Douglas talking about how much she loves hate. And look, first of all, it doesn't bother me, right? This doesn't bother me. Look, look, I've still got the loud stick. I don't feel threatened. In fact, I, I like the hate. And again... So naturally, the way that we deal with online hate is going to differ. Personally, I like to snack on it. <laughs> and if you thought we were done, you'd be wrong. I believe she actually says she likes hate four or five times during the special. I won't show all of them, but here's one last example. I've only been telling this material one room at a time and the hate is already trickling in and it is targeted and it is venomous. But it doesn't bother me. Like, it, just don't worry about it. Like, I snack on it. Mm, no, no, no. It's really it's fine. I find it really strange that someone who says she loves hate so much that she would snack on it between meals would be so opposed to an event that would bring her more of a thing that she loves. I mean, I don't get offended when people offer me pizza. I love pizza. Hannah doesn't just say that she likes hate. She says she actively pokes the bear to get more of it. At the end of that story, I'm going to do a little bit of what I call hate baiting. It's where I bait my haters. It's a very complex idea. Now, the way that I'll do that is I will just say a thing. And I will make no fucking effort to make it funny. You mean like the whole show? Anyway, this Instagram post is not the only time that Hannah plays victim. She did it in her special Douglas as well, which comes right after the comedy special Nanette, where she said she's not a victim. I have autism. Why would she mention this? If you are brave enough to make it through the one hour and 12 minute special, you'll find that pretty much none of the jokes are enhanced by knowing that, except for a quick joke she tells about vaccines. Which is strange because she states that the whole show is centered around that particular mental condition. It should make the show funnier, but so many of her jokes are told in a way that makes that information unnecessary. For example, she talks about a teacher she had as a child and describes a situation where she asked dumb questions in class. And she said, imagine a box. And I could do that. I was gifted to a point. Visual thinker, good box, solid, three-dimensional, nothing fancy, but there. <laughs> and then she said, a preposition is a word that explains your relationship to the box. But I had a question. I said, am I made of box? 
Have you ever taught children before? Kids say things like that all the time. That doesn't really have much to do with autism. So did you say that in your special because it's relevant to a joke you're telling? Or did you say that in your special because having autism puts you in a protected class that will allow you to shout words like hate speech at anyone who has a dissenting opinion? Here's how I look at it. First, Hannah didn't know she was autistic until she was almost 40. Second, autism is an antisocial disorder that makes it difficult for you to understand social cues from people. But when I'm watching this comedy special, what do I see? A person who is public speaking in front of a big audience with a Netflix special performing one of the most difficult social skills, which is getting people to laugh. It takes an incredible amount of social intelligence to make large audiences think you're funny. Now, I certainly don't think she's funny, and I think a ton of people would agree, but at the very least, she has her own crowd laughing, which suggests that she understands social cues. Maybe not to the level that Dave Chappelle understands them, but certainly more than the average person. So at what point is this a disability that you can claim victim status for? You clearly have no problem throwing around the term hate speech, which is just a political silencing tool that has pretty much nothing to do with actual hatred. Now, I will give Hannah some credit. Hannah actually has been the victim of some pretty horrible crimes. Unfortunately, this is YouTube, so I have to say the YouTube-friendly version, but I'm sure you can figure out what I mean in the upcoming sentence. Hannah was the victim of violent assault. She was the victim of involuntary sex as an adult. And she was the victim of extra special child playtime when she was a kid. These things are absolutely horrible, and Hannah, I'm sorry that you had to experience that. People who harm children are the worst kinds of people. But when I say this next thing, maybe you'll understand why I don't trust that Hannah mentioned her autism simply for comedic effect, because Hannah and people like her are constantly trying to claim special status so that when bad things happen to them, they get special treatment. Hannah describes her assault as a hate crime, which is a term used to describe that you have been a victim of assault, but you have special status, so your assault is extra special. This actually devalues the experience of other victims of assault, by saying that their experience isn't as valid because they aren't a part of a protected group. What happened to Hannah was horrible, and it was done by people who are evil, but constantly insisting that you are a part of a special class leads you to thinking that certain behaviors are okay for you to do, but not okay for other people to do, when in reality, it's wrong if anyone does it. For example, The only people who lose their humanity are those who believe they have the right to render another human being powerless. They are the weak. Do you not see the irony of this statement? What do you think cancel culture is? You may not be physically harming the person, but you are taking away their ability to feed or provide shelter for themselves and their families. And a lot of times, it's worse than simply you lose your job. It's you lose your job, and these activists are so insane that they will check up on you and make it so you lose your next job and the job after that. So how exactly are you the good guy here? when you write messages like this on Instagram that encourage cancel culture. I showed sympathy for what happened to you, particularly the stuff that happened to you when you were a child. That's something I do all the time on this channel. But let me ask you this. Did you show sympathy towards Dave Chappelle when he told the story of how his friend died? You said you watched his whole special, so you should know that the events that led to that were committed by people who think they are a part of a special class, so their bullying didn't count. When do we ever see sympathy from the woke crowd for anyone who is not on their team? Instead, what we see is people like Hassan and Ethan laughing at a guy who died of COVID because he had political beliefs that they didn't like. All right, moving on. The Herman Cain Awards. Like, I rip heavy into, like, conservative commentators who get COVID and die. Like, Mm -hmm. After God rips into them, I'm I'm taking one too. Sloppy you know what seconds. I mean? Yeah, I'm taking God's sloppy seconds there. <laughs> so when they die, I celebrate it. Right. For sure. I mean, I'm I'm a horrible person, so don't don't, you know. <laughs> if you want all the chaos to stop, then you need to treat your opponents like humans instead of like trash. And I am saying this to people on both sides of the political spectrum. If we don't start doing that and people just go on believing that they are the exception to the rule, so their bad behaviors don't count then bad things will continue to happen. Because here's where this rhetoric gets dangerous. Do you know why I love picking on straight white men and telling jokes about straight white men? Because they're such good sports. (laughs) (laughs) They're like, oh, good joke about me. Maybe the actual reason is that you aren't afraid of being canceled by them. Wow, that's really brave of you. You really speak truth to power, going after the group you know won't fight back. Here's the thing. 
If you are allowed to criticize someone, then they aren't in power. If you want to know who's really in power, then think about who you aren't allowed to criticize. Look, if you want to criticize me for being straight and a man or make jokes about that, I have no problem. I believe in free speech. But what I really find offensive is you saying that you can criticize me, but I'm not allowed to criticize you. That's unfair, particularly when the crap she is saying is not even true. Uh, so I'm not very experienced in, in, you know, controlling anger. It's not my place to be angry on a comedy stage. I'm supposed to be doing self-deprecating humour. Um, people feel safer when men do the angry comedy. Uh, they're the kings of the genre. When I do it, I'm just a miserable lesbian ruining all the fun on the banter. When men do it, heroes of free speech. They say things like that because you aren't good. Anger can be hilarious whether it comes from a male or a female comedian, so if people aren't laughing at that, it's because you aren't funny. So let's bring this back home for a second because this video is about caring about other people. We can tell that Hannah cares more about herself than her audience because she doesn't make an effort to adjust her material so people find her funny and because she doesn't extend sympathy to people who politically disagree with her. That last part is really important. Now, if you were to follow my internet activity, you would find that I interact with my viewers a lot, but I also argue with people a lot. I do that because I'm trying to figure out which arguments work on people who disagree with me. Most of those arguments fail, but every so often a good one is found, and then that goes into a video. More importantly, what I've really found after years of making videos is this. Most people don't care about what you said. At the end of the day, they only care about how you made them feel. Apparently Maya Angelou said that. So if you just want to shout your opinion at someone who disagrees with you, nothing you say will matter. The other person will remember none of it. But if they said something like, I believe what I believe because a long time ago this bad thing happened to me, and you respond, wow, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. I understand what you're saying. Here's how I believe the problem can be resolved. A conversation like that where disagreeing parties are respectful of each other will go 10 times better than one where you just shout your opinions. Even if you still disagree at the end, the good faith and the relationship building is the important part. The older I get, the more I realize that the rules of debate need to change. Because if they don't change, one side will shout louder and win, and the side who loses will end up in a camp. That's why I don't like it when woke groups say horrible things about straight white men, and then say, you aren't allowed to say anything about their group. Identity politics always ends in violence. The way we stop that is by realizing that we have common ground. The left will say, big monopolistic corporations are evil, and all they want is to turn everyone into slaves. While the right will say, big monopolistic government is evil, and all it wants is to turn everyone into slaves. Actually, both of those things are true. A story can have more than one villain. But if we insist on yelling at each other just to be right instead of fixing the problem, the divide and conquer strategy will work, and those two evil entities will get exactly what they want. So what we do is we change the rules of debate by using techniques to help us understand each other, and by creating a system where we can all work together despite our ideological differences. That starts by taking an interest in the people you are speaking to. But with that said, I think that's enough for this video. So if you liked it, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, comment and share, if you would like to support this channel, then you can do so with PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar. You can find all of those links in the description. Last, don't forget to check me out on Odyssey and Minds.com. You can also find those links in the description. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.